All right. Well, this is, it. I really enjoy doing this class because um, we're going to tell you everything we know about teens, which will take 36 seconds. Um, and actually, if we were to do justice to teenagers, it would take us a century to, to you know, I mean, teenagers are just that complex. So in fact, that's the first thing we're going to talk about. What is the deal with teenagers? This is like an eight year span of life, yet it torments so many people. It's such a pivotal time. Why do we have to devote a whole class to just understanding teenagers, let alone, you know, get degrees in adolescent psychology and so forth? What is the deal with teens? Did you know that the whole concept of teenagerhood, of adolescence, wasn't even invented until the 20th century. What did you have before that then if there weren't any teenagers? Simple, you had kids and you had adults. Those were your only two choices. Um, if you read your Bible, if you read your Old Testament, people assumed responsible positions in society a lot earlier than they do now. Um, in fact, let's take my own, my own people. As I told you this morning, I was, I'm, Jewish, I was raised Jewish, um, from biblical times through the present, if you're Jewish, you're a kid until you turn 13. And at that point, according to Jewish law, you're now prepared to take on all the responsibilities of adulthood, which is really funny because I think about myself when I was, was 13, I wasn't ready to take on responsibility for my shoes. I mean, let alone adulthood but it's still celebrated this way in Jewish culture. House. That's what the bar mitzvah um, is. I believe so, it's yes. a celebration and someone's, okay. It's a celebration of your passage into adulthood. Um, then you have a bar mitzvah and it's a big party and you get pen, pens and pencil sets for a gift. There are still cultures that do it this way. This is the, the it's a tribe called the Seder Ma. They're in the Brazilian Amazon. And you know how they note the passing of adult into adulthood? They take their 13-year-old boys and they take these, there are these insects called bullet ants. And they're called bullet ants because they sting and cause an extremely painful sting. So this is what they do in the Seder Amal culture. When your child turns 13, they get a bunch of these bullet ants and then they sedate the bullet ants with some kind of um, herbal solution that knocks them out. They then, get this, take the bullet ants and sew them into a pair of gloves with the stinger facing into the gloves. You, you with me so far? Then this 13-year-old boy must wear the gloves until the ants come out of their stupor and start stinging the way out of the kid's hands. This is the Seder Ma bullet ant initiation into adulthood. And if they can stand it, then they are ready for adulthood. Personally, give me the bar mitzvah any day. I'd rather have the pen and pencil set than the, than the ants. On the other hand, perhaps this is something we should re-explore as, as a possible um, punishment, going back to the last one. The concept of adolescence was actually born when the, in the 20th century when the middle class started noticing that their kids were residing for longer periods in the home and they required more years of schooling you know not like now where they stay in your home till they're 30. So ad adolescence was invented in the 20th century to refer to this intermediary period of time. Now for an example this is a um, the term really proliferated in the 20th century. This diagram shows the number of occurrences of the term adolescence in literature. If you look in the 1800s, you never saw that word in literature, like newspaper articles and books. Here's the, here in 1900, it starts taking off, 1950 all the way into 1980. Now we talk about it all the time, because it's a thing. Um, however, I want to show you this funny slide. People have been complaining about teenagers for a really, really long time long before the term was even invented. Let me read you a quote. I see no hope for the future of our people if they're dependent on the frivolous youth of today. 
for certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. When I was young, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders, but the present youth are exceedingly wise and impatient of restraint. Who do you think said that? Your father or like your teacher in sixth grade. It was this dude in 800 BC. I believe he was a Greek poet. Um, 800 BC, and they're talking about teenagers just like we do now. Let me read you another one. The children nowadays love luxury. They show disrespect for elders and love chatter in the place of exercise. Children are now tyrants, not the servants of their households. They no longer rise when elders enter the room. They contradict their parents, chatter before company, and tyrannize their teachers. Who said that? Socrates. 470 BC. <laughs> Isn't that funny? 400 BC, and they're talking about teens the same way we're talking about them now. So apparently teens have been at this for a while. Let's look at one more. The young people of today think of nothing but themselves. They have no reverence for parents or old age. They're impatient of all restraint. They talk as if they alone know everything, and what passes for wisdom in us is foolishness in them. As for girls, they are foolish and immodest and unwomanly in speech, behavior, and dress. That is from Peter the Hermit, who I think was a um, cleric. He was a cleric back in 1083. No wonder he was a hermit if you talk about girls like that. So you see the point, right? Teenagerhood and all of its problems have been around for at least a few centuries. Teenagers have gotten really good at it. This is the problem. Because of the influence of media and the way things have changed in the last five decades, it's like all these bad connotations of adolescence, it's like they've become a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like now we just expect that all teens are going to be rebellious and all teens are going to sow their wild oats and all teens are going to have terrible relationships with their parents. It's like we now anticipate this biological change that starts at about age 13 and persists until you kick the kid out of their house or get them off your payroll. But if you look at it, every adolescent kid has basically the same constellation of problems. Now this is important. Why don't little kids go through the same problems that adolescents do? Because as you're gonna see, little kids are not physically, cognitively, or psychologically mature enough to even have these conflicts. They're not strong enough physically to get on, survive on their own even if they wanted to. Little kids don't have the cognitive capacity to come up with their own opinions yet, so they need your opinions. Um, teens, however, they're different. So we have to study what happens again along the developmental continuum. So I'm gonna show you, in case you missed it from this morning, we're just gonna to touch on these again. You remember, you remember that kids that transition. transition. Let me let someone unmute or mute themselves. So remember, kids transition from egocentrism to sociocentrism, and that takes a lot, a lot of time. You remember that. Then you remember the stages of Piaget's stages of development. For this teen class, I want to focus on that last one, formal operational stage, from 11 until we don't know. Only in that stage are kids beginning to think abstractly and can learn from experience and think about things that have, ha haven't happened yet. So only then from 11 on are they able to contemplate God's existence and their need for people. So what I'm saying is when it comes to teens, I think sometimes parents expect their teens to be psychologically more mature than they are prepared to be. And they think teens should understand these deep philosophical spiritual concepts. Most of us came to our spiritual convictions well into our 20s, only when we were cognitively and intellectually able to understand all this stuff. So I think parents set, put, I don't wanna say it set their expectations too high, but you get what I mean. I think they expect things that kids, teens are not yet capable of doing. Once again, you remember the frontal lobe, which is the last part of the brain to develop. And it's the last 5% of the brain that doesn't develop into the 20s. So this is important to know from the standpoint of behavior management. If a teen 
is not yet neurologically capable of controlling him or herself from within, all the more important that you should control him or her from without by consequences, supervising and managing consequences. So these are some of the cognitive and neurodevelopmental issues that make adolescents so weird. Now let's talk about some of the psychosocial crises that they face as they become adolescents. The biggest, most mind-blowing crisis that teens have to face and go through is the identity crisis. You may have heard of it, you may have suffered it from self. Erickson, one of our, one of our founding fathers in the faith of psychology, defined identity as the sense of self that we achieve through examining and committing ourselves to the roles and pursuits that define an adult in our society. Very good definition, very succinct. He said that identity is ultimately defined by three things, sexuality and gender role. Man, what a topic right now, right? Occupation, which is what they want to do for a career, and religious or political beliefs. That, when he got all those things straight, said Erickson, then you've got an identity. But think of how long it takes for some of those things to settle in. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up until well into my 20s. I still am not sure I know what I want to be when I grow up. Um, you know, our religious perspectives, you know, so once again, we don't want to expect too much of our teens. Now here, um, Erickson also believed that every phase of life is characterized by a crisis. And I know you can't see that because there's too much information. What he said was at every stage of life, you go through a crisis. You can't go to the next stage of life until you've passed through the current crisis. You, you can't collect $100 and you can't pass go until you've gotten through whatever it is that you're at that point you're at. Now, if you look at the crisis of adolescence, which is right down here, 12 to 18 years, it's the crisis of identity, forming an identity versus role confusion. Teenagers are struggling to become unique. That's why you see so many, they're struggling to form an identity of their own. That's why you see so many screwy fashions and weird haircuts and stuff like that and taste in music changes, and there's moodiness and temperamentalism. Um, it, the, I remember um, when I was at, in, had just started college, I decided my identity, I went to, to college on the beach, I wanted to be an oceanographer. My identity was I was gonna look like a, a, a sailor, a merchant marine. So I grew these mutton chops, let them grow uncontrolled all the way out to here. Not a lovely beard like I'm looking at Jay. That Jay's got a nice full beard. I had mutton chops like a sailor. And I grew them to ridiculous. I thought I looked awesome. Everyone else would look at me and think, what is up with that dude? I was trying to establish an identity. That's what I wanted to be, a, a merchant marine. The interesting thing is this, as adolescents try to become unique, how do you become unique? You find lots of other people who are just like you to get support. So that's the paradox of adolescence. I want to be different. I want to be like everyone else. But as long as there are other people that are like me, will validate the way I am. That's why we have trends. Now, we're going to play a game. Name the trend game. I'm going to show you some adolescent identities. And you tell me the name for them. And my chat seems to be out on the fritz again. So you're going to have to. What's that? What do we call that? Grunge, 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 grunge. There you go. Grunge or goth, right? So there's, there's your basic goth. What do you call that? Computer nerd. Computer nerd. Nerd. <laughs> Nerds. Woo! Woo! Like, I'm trying not to identify with this one, but yeah. Come on, <laughs> nerd. So you jocks, just remember, this guy is going to be your boss when you're done bullying him and flushing his head down the toilet. Oh, speak of the devil, who's that? Jock. What do jock. we call these people? They're, they still have them, right? Yeah. Okay, so there's still jocks in the world. Glad to, glad to see they're not extinct. What, this is a new one. Gang member? 
alternative mem gang member. Let me give you a hint. Take the look, look at his some of his tattoos. It's right on there. Evidently, this is a thug. Thug life. Yep. Thug. Yo, this is a thug. I didn't know that until I read his tattoo. And I was like, oh, okay, that's that's called a thug. Uh what about what about what about this? What do we call this person? <laughs> Anyone? Duck Dynasty? Okay. <laughs> Redneck. Thank you. Whoever had the nerve, the courage to say it. Yes, this is a redneck. If you lived here in lovely North Carolina, you wouldn't have hesitated. Everyone has a brother like this in, in the South. This, this here's Bubba. Yeah, I don't know about the tying the shirt off thing. What's this? Dreadhead. Oh, yeah. No. Say what? Dreadhead. Rasta? Oh, dreadhead. dreadhead. Ra White Rasta. What's the more common? Think uh, uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Oh. Pothead. Yeah, pothead or a stoner, dude. It's a stoner. Jay, you're getting a little too enthusiastic about this. <laughs> Uh, I think. So yeah, this is Stoner. What do we call these people? <laughs> High school musical. Glee club. Like Glee club people. Yeah, Glee, the Glee people. Now drama kids. These are these are your music and drama people in high school. Um, which I yeah, yeah. I see you pointing at things, but let me show you this picture. Um, this is yours truly. Um, circa 1972, over here on the left, that's me, in my first, yet certainly not by any means last, barbershop quartet. So I have a firm identifying with um, both the nerds and the glee people. Thank you, dual membership. So that's trends. That's why, that's why these things happen. Now, let's take a quick and very brief dip into an interesting 21st century phenomenon. You know, when, when Erickson said, part of identity is gender role, my goodness. Mary and I never heard of any of these terms in our first 30 years of being psychologists, I'd say. We never heard of any of these, except maybe homosexual. The rest have proliferated since then. Mary and I routinely get calls from desperate parents from all over the country saying my son or daughter just told us he or she is one of these. And we're like, what, what, remind me again, what is that? A lot of the time when we see the kids in our office, they say they're one of these things, but they don't really yet understand what that means. So we will see a kid who says, I came out to my parents and I told him, I told my mom and dad that I'm a homosexual. And we'll say, oh, so that means you have sex with other people your gender. And they say, well, no, I, I don't have sex yet. And so we say, well, that means you're asexual. You're not a homosexual. Or they think there's something and they get on social media where they get guided into thinking they're one of these things. Now, let me show you another screen. This is coming up so frequently now. I have to be, Mary and I have to be woke, as they say. So I had to ask a team what these terms are. And I, one of the ladies that works for me has had a 14 year old girl who was very in touch with all this. So I asked her to text me an explanation. And this is what she said. She said, okay, basically gender queer and non-binary are the same thing, not exclusively feminine or masculine, not exclusively a woman or a man. They fall out of the gender binary. Gender fluid, that's when your gender changes. They don't have a fixed gender. It's a dynamic mix of boy and girl or anything in between. Demi-girl, they feel partially but not wholly female and feminine. Demi-boy, they feel partially but not wholly male or masculine. Bi-gender, their personal identity aligns with two genders. A-gender, they don't identify as any gender and typically use they, them pronouns. Pansexual, they have sexual and romantic attraction to all genders. Poly, they have sexual and romantic attraction to more than two genders. I didn't know there were more than two genders. 
So for instance, they would find attraction towards people who are female, gender fluid, and by gender, but not attracted to males. Demisexual, only attracted to people once they've established a connection. Asexual, no sexual attraction. Aromantic, no romantic attraction. Gray sexual, very rarely have sexual attraction only at certain circumstances. I think that's the ones I can think of. By the time I had finished this text, my head had exploded and there, were, there was blood and brains all over the walls that I had to clean up because I could not process all this. Um, just incredible to think about. When you get stuck on things like this, you have to ask yourself, what does the Bible say? Yeah, we're, we're just going to put these scriptures up. We're not going to go into detail, but you may want to write them down and spend some time with them yourself and, and spend some time with your kids, your older kids with them as well. Um, here's the only thing I want to say about this. I, I mean, obviously, this topic is a way beyond our pay grade and, and experience and expertise um, and way beyond what we can deal with in this whole time. But what I will say is that as Christians, especially as parents, you need to be aware of these issues. You can't keep your head in the sand because it is everywhere right now. And our kids are dealing with it constantly. And you've got to be prepared to talk with your kids about what you believe, what the Bible says. You've got to educate yourself. Um, two resources that I want to give you in, in case you're not aware of them. Uh, of course, the first one is Guy Hammond's ministry, the Strength and Weakness Ministry. You can go online. He has some excellent resources. He's published a number of books. He is a wonderful person. And this is his work. This is what God has called him to do. And he does an excellent job at it. So I would put you in touch with that ministry um, there's another book called Homosexuality and the Christian by a man uh, named Jay Yarhouse, Y-A-R-H-O-U-S-E, and it's an excellent resource because what our kids are being told these days is that if you're dealing with any of these tendencies or feelings, you were born that way. That's, that's the line. That's the popular line, that you were born that way. There's nothing you can do about it. It was predetermined. That's just who you are. And the fact is, like anything else we know as Christians, it's a choice. You know, no matter no matter how we're no, what our tendency is sexually, we choose how we're going to express our sexuality. And our kids need to know that there is a choice. It's not a predetermined you were just born this way. Um, so like I said, that book, that book is an excellent resource about how to present that that issue to your to your kids. I'm looking. Thank you for your I finally got our chat back. Um, sorry about the cool girls and the cheerleaders. Sorry, we just didn't identify that with that. So we, we kind of skipped over them. So we're, we're never cool girls. Yeah, we were. I was never a cool girl. So sorry about that. I tried to be a cheerleader, but that my legs were too hairy. So before we go on, let's pause and reflect. Um, getting through adolescence, put yourself in the shoes of an adolescent. You've all been one. It isn't easy. Now let's throw in some. So, so that's just regular adolescence. Let's throw in some things that make it even more difficult. Um, you know, teens have the same psychiatric problems that adults do. The difference is... Um, they present differently. So in other words, teen, uh, depression, for example, in teenagers doesn't look like depression in adults. Adults tend to get vegetative and, um, you know, don't want, they cry all the time. They don't want to get out of bed. Teens get irritable and angry. We'll talk about that more in a second. Before we talk about some common psychiatric problems to teens, keep this in mind. Every psychiatric problem Depression, anxiety, any of the ones we're going to talk about has four components. Unless all four of these components are addressed, you're not going to make long-term improvement. The biological component involves things like um, your biology. Your, you, you might have a genetic predisposition to a certain disorder. In other words, you may have mood, uh, depression or bipolar or other mood disorders in your family. Therefore, you're more likely to have them. You might have a, a physical condition that predisposes you to depression, like hypothyroidism or um, 
COPD. There's a million medical diseases that predispose you to depression. Um, you might have hormonal or glandular problems. So these are, these are the biological components of mental health disorders. The psychological component is things like a kid's temperament. Temperament is the part of your personality that is God-given. If you're a parent of more than one child, you may have noticed that your kids are very different. And you're like, what's up with that? They grew up with the same family under the same roof. Why are they so different? Is because a component of everyone's personality is a God-given, it's called temperament. How reactive we are, how laid back we are, how excitable we are. Um, so some of these is you might have a kid who's temperamentally predisposed to have worrisome thoughts or temperamentally predisposed to be um, anxious or insecure. Social factors involve things like the family environment um, or the community environment or societal norms. Um, the example I give is I was raised, as I mentioned, by a Jewish mother. Jewish mothers are supreme worriers. They know how to worry. It's they, my mother turned it into an art form. Therefore, I was raised in a household where, you know, you, you're supposed to worry about things. It's everyone else's problem because they're not concerned about this. Or if you've been traumatized or abused as a child, these could be social factors that predispose you later to a mental health problem. And lastly, this is the part that doesn't get much press in the world. Uh, as it was mentioned, part of my job now is training young physicians. My young physicians that I teach know the biological, psychological, and social aspects of mental health problems. Rarely do they deal with the, the spiritual. But I believe that in every team, there's a spiritual crisis. In every team that, that has a disorder like anxiety or depression, there's a spiritual crisis that needs to be dealt with. Um, because as a kid forms his own identity, he's likely to either come in line with his parents' beliefs or oppose his parents' spiritual framework. So with our kids, our kingdom kids, they're going to struggle with what they've been taught. They've got to, or else they're going to become cookie cutter Christians, which don't endure for the long run. So it's okay for teens to have a spiritual crisis. And when a teen has depression or an anxiety disorder, I can guarantee you there's an element of, does God exist? Does God love me? Why is he letting me go through this? Um, in the interest of time, let me skip ahead a little bit. Let's start, let's talk about a few of these classes of disorders real quickly. We'll start with the mood disorders. And there's three types you're most likely to see with teens. There's major depressive disorder, which is a severe, um, almost incapacitating depressed mood. And you're, it hits like a truck and you're down for the count and you can barely do anything from one day to the next. But eventually it's an episodic thing. So eventually you return to a baseline mood. Now the most common age of onset for mood disorders like depression is late teens and early 20s. So if your kids are going through some depressed period and you're like, there's no reason for this. I don't see why he or she is so depressed. It could be the initial onset of a hereditary or a biologically based depression. Persistent depressive disorder gets a lot less notoriety. It's not so crippling, not so debilitating. It's more like a chronic low level lack of joy. In kids though, dysthymia, which is its other name, can be irritability. If they're all the time irritable and short tempered, and there's no reason for it. And, you know, everything else is going well. If it's, a, it, it could be, that's what dysthymia looks like in teens. It's kind of an incapacity and inability to feel joy. And uh, bipolar will just touch on, to, despite what you, you know, the media makes bipolar sound like whenever you're moody, that means you're bipolar. But technically to have the diagnosis of bipolar disorder, you have to go through distinct phases of mania which is when you feel fantastic and you're energetic and you don't sleep and you go from one thing to the next to the next and the next and you do crazy impulsive things, maybe impulsive spending or impulsive sexual activity. Then you hit a wall and you crash into a depression. There is such a thing as rapid polar, rapid cycling bipolar, where you go through that many times in a day. 
There's slow cycling bipolar, where it might be months in a depression, then months in a manic episode. Um, so what causes these things? In short, there are chemicals in your brain, they're called neurotransmitters, that allow brain cells to communicate with each other. We know for a fact that with mood disorders, some of these neurotransmitters are deficient, principally serotonin, that's the most common one, dopamine and norepinephrine. Um, consequently, the biological component of mood disorders can be treated with, the, with medication. If you wanna know more about it, if you go to Kidogo, which is a, the, the little group that does all the videos for disciples today, Google someday Kidogo with my name, Shapiro, K-E-Y-D-O-G-O, -E Shapiro. And I do a four minute video, you'll see it, on what causes mood disorders and so forth. The psychological component of mood disorders can be treated with therapy. So what I tell people is medication, antidepressants, some of which are listed here, lift the mood. You can't benefit from therapy if you're having depressive thoughts and suicidal thoughts all the time. The purpose of medication, I tell people, is to lift that cloud off your head long enough to make, benefit, make gains in, in therapy. Um, and the kind of therapy we use, cognitive behavior therapy, family therapy or dialectic behavior therapy. We won't describe what those are. But what I tell my little young physicians is treatment of a mood disorder is a two-winged airplane, medication and therapy. One will work well and the other will work out well, but neither alone will work as well as both of them together. So usually treatment for any of these mood disorders is a combination of therapy and antidepressants. I'm just gonna quickly go through some of the emotional and spiritual struggles that teens face when they're dealing with these disorders. Um, with depression, the biggest one is negative thinking. Um, that can be negative about everything, everything, but mostly negative thinking about themselves. You know, most teens with depression have very low self-esteem. Uh, they feel useless, they feel worthless, and, and what makes it a deadly illness sometimes is they feel hopeless. They feel like they're always gonna feel that way. You know, they don't understand, as Michael said, that mood disorders are episodic. You know, that sometimes you only have one episode of depression and then you get better and you never have it again. Um, so they feel like things are never gonna change. You know, one of the things that is helpful for us to tell them is that that negative thinking, that hopelessness and those feelings of worthlessness is part of the illness itself. That is part of depression. It's a symptom of the illness. You know, sometimes when I'm in a therapy session with a teen and they start talking about, you know, how, how terrible they are and how they're not worth anything. And I'll stop them and I'll go, no, that's the depression talking. That's your illness. That's not, that's not a true thought. Okay. It's, and we know that your feelings are broken. That's how you got this diagnosis of depression. So don't trust that when, when you feel that way. Um, they also need to know that it's temporary, you know, that you are going to feel better someday. And, and they don't feel that way. They don't have that kind of hope. We have to give them that hope. Um, with, with teens that are dealing with a bipolar disorder um, or a, a um, anyway, um, as Michael mentioned, um, they're, they're prone to very impulsive behaviors, spending a lot of money, driving too fast, sexual acting out, anger outbursts. Um, and again, they need to know that this is part of the illness, you know, that you, you, can, you want to work to control those things, but that is part of the illness itself. Um, the way that you can help them the most is to help them stay compliant with their treatment. You know, a lot of people that are dealing with bipolar disorder, they miss the high phase of the disorder. And so if you get them effectively treated with medication and therapy, sometimes they'll pull themselves out of it because they miss feeling that high that they used to feel. Now, the bottom side of that is severe depression. You know, so when they pull themselves out of treatment, they go through that terrible cycle again. So helping them stay compliant with the treatment that, that their therapist and their doctor have set up for. Um, 
The other problem that they have is being inconsistent, inconsistent in their schoolwork, inconsistent in their relationships. Um, if they're Christians, even inconsistent in their relationship with God, which makes sense if you think about that, they're going through these very intense mood changes. So consistency is very difficult when, you, when you're doing that. Um, sometimes I will reframe it for them and say, let's focus on you being faithful. Let's focus on you being faithful with your schoolwork. What's that? What is that going to look like? It may not be the same every day. If you feel really bad on Tuesday, it may not be that. But what is faithful in this semester going to look like for you? What is faithful in your relationship with God going to look like? That that you tell him how you're feeling every day. That you write down on the three by five card one of your favorite scriptures and you read it three times a day. That's being faithful in your relationship with God. So try to try to help them figure out how can I do that in spite of these mood changes that, that I'm dealing with. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to move really quickly through this next session so we can pick up a little bit of time. Um, here, here's the deal with, with suicide. You know, if you think about the pressure that our teens are under anyway, I mean, they're trying to form an identity. They're trying to build relationships outside of the family, uh, school, which is hugely stressful these days. You know, they're, I mean, high school is all about making the numbers, right? So you can get to college and be successful. So a lot of pressure. And then if you put on top of, of our teens, anything like one of these mood disorders, the deal is that things can get very bad very quickly. And suicide is a part of that. Um, some of the signs, the warning signs for suicide in teens is when they have a drop in grades, an uncharacteristic drop of grades. You know, I, this kid was a straight A student last year and now they can barely pass class. Um, you know, they, they used to be a good student and really be interested. Now they don't even care about school anymore. They don't even want to go to school anymore. Um, by the way, just an aside, the pandemic has been really tough on our teens. It's, it's been tough. They, they've taken a big hit. Um, the social isolation and virtual instruction for our teens was a disaster for a lot of them. So it's, it's been a tough year. Um, being isolated from peers and family, you know, where they don't want to be around anyone. That's, that's a warning sign. Um, you know, if you think about it, teens are very social beings. This is a time where being social and making peer connections is hugely important. If they're backing away from that, that should be a red flag. Um, you know, being losing interest in things that they used to love doing. This is actually a symptom of depression called anhedonia. Um, you know, I had a kid one time, I was seeing a little girl, a high schooler, and she loved basketball, and she was very good at basketball. She was on the basketball team, and she had dropped out of the team, and I asked her, I said, why did you not play basketball this year? And she said, well, I just haven't been myself. You know, that's, that's classic, all right? I'm depressed. I don't even feel like doing something that I used to love to do. Um, the deal is, anytime a teen, or, or a kid for that matter, makes a suicidal statement, you need to take it very seriously. And they need to be seen by somebody pretty immediately that can assess how much danger they're in. Um, you know, it's hard, it is hard even for us, uh, for clinicians to tell how serious someone is when, when they're talking about suicide. Um, so don't think, oh, they're just manipulating me or they're just trying to get attention. There may be a part of that in there, but it needs to be, it needs to be assessed. At least we need to, we need to um, try to deal with it. Okay, skip past that. Let's talk about a special kind of um, a phenomenon we're seeing right now that's related to suicide, and that's Non-suicidal self-injury, NSSI, but you didn't know it had an acronym already, but it does. So I, as you can imagine, Mary and I in the office see lots of kids who've been cutting or doing something else to themselves. And the first thing you gotta wonder is why would someone do this? We're so genetically engineered for survival. You know, that's what every core, every molecule of human being is to perpetuate the species, what would make someone want to hurt themselves? So for a while, I started asking all these adolescents I was seeing, why do you, what makes you do this? And then here are some things that I heard. 
I mean, one of them was, well, everyone else is doing it. I got onto a, a Facebook page and they showed me how to do this. So when that happens, if a kid's just doing it to be like everyone else or to earn street cred with other kids who are doing it, they won't hide their injuries. They'll expose them because that's part of the point. Same with manipulation. If they are doing it, you know, well, you told me if they say to their parents, you told me I couldn't have the car. Well, I'm just going to go hurt myself if you don't let me date this boy or you don't let me go out, you know, skip school or something like that. Once again, it wouldn't, if you're using it manipulatively, it wouldn't make sense to hide your injury so they'll expose it. I've had kids tell me I needed to feel something. I was numb. I was emotionally numb. Or I just wanted to, I felt so bad emotionally. I wanted something in my body to distract my, you know, to hurt just as much to distract me from thinking about how depressed I was. I've had, I've heard kids say it's a control thing. You know, I hear this with eating disorders as well. I can't control anything. You know, usually this is from kids in abusive families. So I control, I'll hurt myself or I'll stop eating or I'll make myself throw up. Self-punishment, you know, they feel so guilty or tormented. They feel that they deserve it. There's even a getting a high, you know, when you hurt yourself, your body releases endorphins, which are natural um, painkillers. So it's a way of getting high, believe it or not. And then, of course, just to look like, you know, Kurt Cobain or any number of, I don't even know if he's a thing, if he's a thing anymore, but they just want to fit in with the culture. So once again, as Mary said, bottom line is it doesn't matter why they're doing it. It doesn't matter if they're hiding their injuries or not. Any type of self-harm is an unhealthy way to deal with emotions, and it has to be addressed. To make things worse is uh, NSSI can become addictive. It can become self-perpetuating. So these kids need help. We'll talk about that shortly too. Let's quickly talk about some anxiety disorders that teens might experience. And there's a bunch of these. Generalized anxiety disorder is the most common. That's when you worry about everything all the time. As I said, my mother did worry about everything all the time. But the reason she never had a diagnosis of generalized anxiety disorder is she didn't realize it was weird. To her, it was perfectly normal. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to worry about everything. People with generalized anxiety disorder understand that their compulsive anxiety is not normal. They're worried about things that might never happen or are unlikely to happen. My kids are going to get kidnapped. A meteor is going to fly through my window, you know. So what makes it disturbing to them is they know that their anxiety is irrational. Panic disorder is just when anxiety happens in a discrete episode. It's a short circuit. Someone before mentioned the flight or fight response, which is a complex neurological and endocrinological reaction to a threat. When you have panic disorder, it's when that reaction happens without a stimulus. And it, it, for a while, you feel extremely anxious. You have these signs of autonomic nervous system, high blood, you know, um, high respiration, high heart rate. Your stomach slows down, your pupils dilate, and then it goes away. OCD, this is another one I hate being misrepresented in the media. Everyone makes it sound like if you're perfectionistic or persnickety, you have OCD. Oh, you are so OCD. That's not what OCD is. To have a diet, OCD is actually an anxiety disorder. It's when you have an anxious thought that you can't get rid of and you try to neutralize it with a compulsive behavior. Like a common one is an anxious thought is everything has germs and it's gonna infect me and I'm gonna die. The compulsive behavior to neutralize that is, so I'll wash my hands, which I'm getting to. <laughs> so the problem is you wash your hands and then you turn and with OCD, that thought comes right back and then you gotta wash your hands again. Mary mentioned, this is very interesting. Right now, we appear to all have OCD because it's being perpetuated by circumstance. Right now, it's so interesting. This is the first time in history where society has normalized the pathology. 
So now if you're worried about germs all the time and you're washing your hands all the time, that's actually normal. So you don't need medication and therapy. But there are other more crippling OCD. I had a patient that always thought every time he hit a bump in the road, he got a nervous thought that he had hit somebody. So he turned around, stopped the car, looked around. He'd go back on his way again. Now he goes five miles and he says, well, maybe I didn't look in the ditch or in the right place. Turn around. So he was late all the time. He got fired from work. It can be crippling. And lastly, PTSD, which deserves its own workshop. Um, that's another one that's kind of misunderstood. Really, to be diagnosed with PTSD, you have to have discrete symptoms. You have to have nightmares, flashbacks. You have to have what's called hypervigilance, which is where you're always thinking the trauma is going to happen again. Now, kids and teenagers get PTSD. What makes it even more interesting is you don't even have to have been the victim of trauma to develop PTSD. You just had to witness it. So after 9-11, we had a rash, an outbreak of PTSD because people were watching the videos over and over again on the news of the towers getting hit. So these are four anxiety disorders that you're, um, you can see in teens. Um, the treatments are uh, much the same as with depression. CBT, which is cognitive behavior therapy, is just teaching you how to capture your thoughts, recognize that they're irrational or unrealistic, and change them. Mindfulness is a way of calming your mind so that you stop thinking about the past, which you can't do anything about anyway. You stop thinking about the future, which isn't even here yet, and you focus on the here and now. So these are effective um, therapies for anxiety disorders. And here are some of the medications that we use to treat anxiety. SSRIs are things like Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, and Lexapro. They're very famous, and they deal with serotonin in the brain. That's why they're very popular. Buspar is one that you take regularly for specifically for anxiety, whereas the SSRIs are for depression and anxiety. Buspar is just for anxiety. Wellbutrin is an atypical antidepressant that's sometimes used for anxiety. The ones I want to mention, Clonopin and Xanax, those are called benzodiazepines. They're very effective for momentary anxiety like um, panic attacks. The problem is they're very addictive benzodiazepines, so you have to be really careful. And usually I'll do an assessment of a patient first to make sure they're not at risk for substance abuse before we prescribe clonopin or, or Xanax. So that's some of the anxiety disorders. I just wanna give you just quickly, just two, um, two little thoughts with the spiritual and emotional struggles. Uh, people that have anxiety disorders, feel very different from other people. You know, they feel, they know that this anxiety that they have is not logical, um, but they can't control it. And so they feel very different and it's really easy for them to get isolated. So if you have a teen, especially that's dealing with an anxiety disorder, you need to try to help them to find one or two people that they can talk to openly about what they struggle with, um, that don't, don't think it's weird, um, but that they feel connected with people, you know, and, and especially our teenagers, what they don't know is that there are a lot of people that deal with these disorders. They're not the only one. Uh, so try to help them not feel so different. Um, the other thing is one of the vicious cycles with an anxiety disorder is when a person becomes anxious about certain things or certain situations, the most natural thing to do is just to avoid it. You know, every time I'm in a big crowd, I, I'm afraid I'm going to have a panic attack. So I just don't go into crowd. I don't want to go into a crowd anymore. Now, the, the bad thing with that is that the more you avoid it, the worse the anxiety disorder gets. And actually, some of the treatments are kind of slowly exposing people to the things that make them anxious until they can face those things without becoming anxious. So let's say your teen says, I get anxious. I'm afraid I'm going to have a panic attack every time I go to school or every time I go to church, every time I'm around a lot of people, um, you know, you actually need to help them to kind of push their limits in a general kind of way. Let's go to church anyway. I'll sit in the back with you 
If you need to get up and leave and take a break, that's fine. But let's let's try to get you in church a little bit. You know, does that make sense? So you want to push them gently to expose themselves to the things that make them anxious. Okay. All right. And lastly, for special things you might see in your kids, let's do a really short review of some of these, um, what I'll term as behavior disorders, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, and conduct disorders. We're going to mention them because they're so misunderstood. So starting with ADHD, and I'll give props to my wife, as I said, um, she is the director of our ADHD clinic. Um, so an acknowledged expert in the field. Um, it's the most diagnosed but least understood disorder in childhood, in my opinion. In fact, by definition, ADHD isn't really a behavior disorder. It's a developmental disorder. It has to do with neurological development. Remember, I told you at the beginning about the frontal lobes having a behavioral repression effect where uh, part of the frontal lobe helps you control behaviors. One of the theories of ADHD is that that part of the brain is not um, mature yet. There are a lot of theories, but it's caused by unusual development of the parts of your brain that control alertness and arousal and inhibition. Many of those are in the frontal lobes. By definition, to have ADHD, you have to show three things in excess of what's expected for your child's level of development. Impulsiveness, inattention, and overactivity. That's the, the, the triad, impulsiveness, inattention, and overactivity. Here's the problem. How many things in childhood or teenagerhood can cause a kid to be impulsive, inattentive, and overactive? Everything, everything. That's why ADHD is so often misdiagnosed. Kids with depression become inattentive, overactive, and impulsive. Kids who are just obnoxious kids can be inattentive, impulsive, and overactive. Kids with anxiety disorders. This is the most commonly misdiagnosed disorder because so many things look like it that aren't. Um, when we evaluate kids for ADHD, we begin with a good developmental assessment because like I said, technically to say a kid has ADHD, they have to show those three things at a lower level than you'd expect for their development. Therefore, first you have to do a developmental assessment. So if this is a 13 year old kid, but he's only got a mental age of a 10 year old because he's a little bit behind neurodevelopmentally, maybe this isn't inappropriate for his mental age. So we do a very thorough um, evaluation of everything before we make that diagnosis. The next one, Oppositional defiant disorder, which Mary and I for years and years have even argued probably shouldn't be considered a disorder, but since we don't run the American Psychiatric Association, they, they're not listening to us for some reason. It's a pattern of behavior. Kids with ODD are angry, irritable, argumentative, and defiant like all the time. Um, it's a childhood or a pre-teen disorder. Now, if you don't get control of it during childhood or preteen years, it may escalate into this next thing, conduct disorder, which is more commonly seen in teens. When it's a conduct disorder, not only are they disobedient and oppositional and defiant, but now they violate the rights, of, habitually violate the rights of others. That means stealing things, um, vandalizing things, being physically aggressive to people or animals. The important distinction is this, ADHD is actually a neurological disorder. The other two are patterns of behavior. And I consider them more like choices. The symptoms of ADHD can be managed with medication, usually stimulants like uh, Ritalin and um, Silert, and there's a million other of them now, Adderall. They stim I tell parents, parents always ask me, why do you wanna put my already overactive kid on a stimulant? because it's stimulating that part of the brain that helps him control himself. It's stimulating that part of the brain to work better. So ADHD can be managed with medication. The others are harder to deal with. And when you get all two or three of them at once, then it's, it's really difficult. I'm just, I'm just gonna give you some. Oops. Sorry. 
uh, quick tips here with these disorders. One is that when a child is diagnosed with one of these disorders, a lot of times they'll try to use it as an excuse. And we and it doesn't help, it's not helpful for them to use that as an excuse. You know, I have kids a lot of times come in my office and I'll say, you know, I want you to sit down in this chair over here and pay attention to this. And they'll say to me, I have ADHD. And I'll go, you know, I know that. I actually was the one that diagnosed you with that. Now, would you sit down in the chair over there and pay attention to what we're about to do? You know, it doesn't help them to let them use it as an excuse. Um, the other thing is as a parent, and this is a hard one, is sometimes you may have to let them take natural consequences for their behaviors. Um, kids with these disorders have a really hard time owning their own behavior and taking responsibility for their own behavior. And what that means as a parent is if your ADHD fifth grader gets loses recess because they were talking at the same time the teacher was talking, you don't go rushing into school and try to save them from that consequence. Go ahead and let them miss recess, all right? That might be a really good way for them to learn to connect. Okay, I cannot talk, no matter how much I feel like talking all the time, I've got to be quiet when the teacher is talking. That's a tough one as a parent, and I get it, you know, but the more, the more you allow them to take consequences, those gentle natural consequences, um, you may be saving them down the road from, you know, being pulled over by the policeman because they were speeding down the highway when they're older. So let them take some of those natural consequences that come their way. Especially when those consequences overlap into other issues. For example, I have a big problem with parents who go to their kids' ball games or other athletic events. And when they think, when they or their kid thinks a call has been made against them unfairly, the parent storms out of the stands and argues with the referee. Not only are you not letting a kid deal with the natural consequence, but you're teaching him subversion of authority and rebelliousness and, you know, how authority doesn't apply to you. So that's just my two cents right there. All right, we're going to end this class. I know you guys thought it was never going to end, but it is um, with just some tips, just some parenting tips. Um, you know, with your teens, especially if your teen is dealing with one of these special issues, try to maintain as normal a family environment as possible. You know, keep your family routines intact. What we're talking about is don't let your child's disorder dictate how the family goes, okay? Um, if you, let's say you have a child with ADHD that has trouble sitting through meals, all right? still have meal time, all right? They may, have to, they may have to get up in the middle of it and walk around the table a few times or, or you know, go into the other room and then come back. But you're, you're teaching them how to deal with the world as it is, with the normal world, which is eventually, no matter what the disorder is, that's eventually what they're gonna have to do, okay? Now, obviously, the more severe the disorder is, the more adjustments you're gonna have to make, but as much as possible, do things like having family meals together and taking vacations and celebrating holidays and just enjoy being together as a family. Um, I worked with a family in Georgia that the, the parents had a couple of biological children and then they started adopting children out of the foster care system. And this family, good country farm family parents, adopted 21 children out of the foster care system in Georgia. And as, as one might imagine, those kids had every diagnosis you can name under every diagnosis that I can think of. I evaluated most of them. But when they came into that home, they were expected to do chores. They were expected to go to church. They were expected to attend mealtime. They were expected to treat each other with respect. And you know what? Those kids did great. I saw most of those kids into adulthood and those kids did great because they didn't change the expectations to fit the child. They changed the child to fit the expectations. And they were not, they were not authoritative parents, all right? They were very kind, loving, warm, but firm parents. So don't, don't let your child's disorder dictate your household. Um, Try to encourage your teen not to remain isolated from peers and family. Don't let them spend all their time in the bedroom on video games. It's not healthy for them. Um, and again, the pandemic has been a disservice in this. Our kids have had to be isolated in the last year. It's going to be a little bit of work, I think, for all of us 
to get them back functioning the way they need to be functioning with other kids, with peers, especially, you know, not all of our kids are going to go back to school and, and have an easy time of it. Not all of our kids are going to go back to a playground and have an easy time of it. They're going to need our help to get reconnected. So even if it's just you having one other child over to play with your kid or one other, other teen over to sit on the deck, to talk with your teen, try to encourage them to connect face-to-face -face with other peers as, as much as it is safe right now. Um, we need to be encouraging physical activity in our kids. You know, again, unplug them, put them out in the yard, have them do something active. Put them on a bike, put them in a, on a soccer field, take a walk with them, get them outside, all right? Um, here's just a little, I'm just going to share, we do a whole class on physical activity as a treatment for these disorders that we've just talked about, all right, for anxiety and depression. I'm going to give you one piece of research. There's one piece of research that says if you burn 350 calories three to four times a week in some kind of sweat producing activity, it can be as effective as prescription antidepressants in decreasing anxiety and depressive symptoms. You know, if I see you in therapy for anxiety or depression, you're gonna go home, your first homework assignment is gonna be, you've got to figure out how to exercise three to four times a week. So we've got to get our kids doing this, all right? It's not just so that they look great in their, in their two-piece uh, at the beach this summer, okay? It's for their mood. It's for their mood. So get them out, get them active. Um, you know, we need to help our kids recognize their own personal strengths and weaknesses. You don't want your teen, if they're diagnosed with one of these things, to define themselves by that diagnosis, all right? That's just, that's just something they have to cope with, all right? Just like if you were diagnosed with heart disease, you wouldn't go around introducing yourself saying, hi, I'm heart disease, all right? You wouldn't do that, all right? It's just something you have to deal with, right? You are still you, and you still got good parts, and you still got bad parts. But our kids, when they get diagnosed with something like this, they, that becomes their identity a lot of times. So you, you know, you tell them, yeah, yes, I know, I know you have a learning disability. I get that. But you know what? You're a great artist and you are very compassionate towards other people. That's who you are as a person. Yes, I know about the reading disorder. I got that. You know, but let me talk about who you are as a person. And they and they need help with that, especially if they're dealing with something like this. Um, the last one is don't forget to pray, all right? The reason we love working predominantly with children and adolescents is that things can change so much in the next few years, you know? If I'm working with a 50-year-old person that has something, I'm a lot less hopeful for that changing than I am if I work with a 15-year-old with something, you know? So have hope and pray for your kids. Pray constantly for your kids. Before I go to the last slide, I want to talk about, you know, we've said a lot of times in this class about unplugging, taking things away, removing electronics. For some reason, parents find this difficult to do. And they say, well, I can't. How am I supposed to take away my phone? My kid's gotten so dependent on the phone or the video game or the tablet. And they get into big fights about this. Just reflect. Remind yourself, whose name is on the contract you signed with Verizon? Is it your sons and daughters or is it yours? In fact, when I have, sometimes when I have a teen in my office and their parents are right there and the kid says, well, I don't want them to take away my phone. And I'm like, oh, um, would you show me the contract, please? And they say, what, what are you talking about? You know, the one you signed with Verizon when you agreed to pay them monthly for your phone usage. These things belong to you, the parents. We're all into empowering parents. We have some parents in our office who make it a habit of every night taking up the electronics and their rule is you charge, all electronics get charged in our room every night. So at 10 o'clock, all the electronics are taken up, put in the room. Now they've told us at three in the morning, they've caught their kids trying to sneak in creep in under the bed so as not to be seen and reach up and unplug the electronics, that's going to be your, you know, you might have to take it to another level. But these are your things. They don't belong to the kids. 
Um, so enough said about that. Just remember, we're just totally into empowering the parents. These things belong to you, not the child. We, we've even, I'll just say this real quickly, when parents and kids are at loggerheads, I've sat down with a teenager and I've said, what is it that you want your parents to do that they're not already doing? They'll say, I just want them to let me do what I want to do. And I'm like, okay, so you think you should be allowed to do whatever you want to do? Yeah, I'm, I'm 16. I should be able to do that. And I say, do you feel any obligation to your parent to do anything for them? No. What have they ever done for me? And I've sat down with adolescent boys usually. And I say, let's, let's get on a piece of paper here. I can't help notice you're not naked today. Did you buy those clothes and those Air Jordans and their, what do they call Air Force Ones? Oh, no. Your parents bought that for you? So I'll write that down. Naked clothes. Um, you seem to be in pretty good health. Did you buy the antibiotics you took for your ear infections when you were two? Oh, no. So they provide you with medical care. Um, did you sleep outside last night? Oh, no. They provide you with housing. I'll do that. And I'll, I'll show this to the kid. And I'll say, your parents provide you with all these things. You feel like you don't have any obligation to return this favor in any way. So once again, it just, now every once in a while, I'll get the kid that says, yeah, I, that's their job. I don't, you know. Now we're into a different realm. But what all we're saying, we're closing out by saying, be empower yourselves as parents. Now, has this all been exhausting? Yes, it's been exhausting to think about teens. It's exhausting to raise teens. So let's close out with some encouragement. Isaiah 55, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Once again, We've seen parents with some of the worst teen behavior in the world. Their kids go off the rails. They leave home. They do all kinds of stuff. They get beat up by the world mercilessly. And then they come back and say, mom and dad, you were right. And it's what you always taught me. The word doesn't come back void. Even if the kids say they never want to walk into church building again after they leave home, something you said while you were raising them in a Christian home is going to stick in there and help them survive. Second Corinthians 10, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Like Mary said, we've seen teens change drastically. They are usually from the households of Christians who employ biblical principles who don't back off from their own convictions and do whatever they need to do to get help raising this kid. So we just want to be encouraging situations we've seen in the world that were hopeless are hopeful as long as you're following God's word. Now, here's some information. Um, we spoke so quickly in an effort to shoehorn us back onto the schedule. So we hope we've done that. And what we'd like to do next is take one more break. Then when we return, we're going to have a really, really, really short class for any parents who either have a special needs kid where none of this that we talked about today applies, or if for some other reason you have a child that this didn't apply to, and we can talk about it. But that's going to be a shorter class. So Tony, if it's okay with you, what if we break for another five minutes and then come back for that? Yes, that sounds great. Five minute break. And then Mike, um, can you make your slides available to us as well? You can email them to me and then maybe I can get them out to everybody. Um, the better idea is to, we kind of prefer to do this. You, you're going to, you have this as a recording, right? Yes. Is to just let people see the recording. We don't like throwing our slides around. I mean, you know, okay. we hate to be that guy, but you know, they have That's a big fine. copyright sign on them. No problem, no problem, we've got the recording. We'll be okay. sure to cast it all over the internet. No, just <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, but any, again, Mike and Mary, thank you so much for that class. I mean, yeah. going through the, the teen years, we've, we have two teenagers, one a freshman in college, one sen senior in high school. And for me anyway, uh, raising teenagers has been the absolute hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> Wow. It's been very challenging, but I'm so grateful for the input and then the encouragement at the end that you've given us as well. The teen years are super tricky and sticky to navigate, 
And I think that you guys did a, a fantastic job of uh, breaking that down and, and helping everybody to see some of the nooks yeah. and crannies and details that it takes. Yeah, I wanna thank you too, because with all of your knowledge, you really took it back to what's true, which is the word of God, that he knows the truth out of all the cultures and changes that happen, the word of God is true. And I second what my husband said and what you said really is that it is challenging, but we fight with weapons of God. And for me, what I've learned is to pray, pray so much because I, I wanted to think A plus B must equal C. And God has taught me that that's not true. It's a work of God. So prayer has really helped me through this time, but it's been an incredible set of classes so far. So thank you. Thank you for teaching us. All right. So everybody, we're taking another five minute break and then we'll be back for the last class on special needs. Thanks. <laughs>